In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The last chapters of Genesis give us the story of Joseph and his coat of many colors. It's a story we teach to children in Sunday school, but it was also turned into a musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Donny Osmond famously portrayed Joseph. I never saw it, but I wondered, given that so much of Joseph's story can be depressing, how did that famous Osmond smile fit in? Joseph's story is depressing because his 10 brothers do a great evil against him. Joseph is his father Jacob's favorite son, and Jacob, also known as Israel, gave him a colorful coat to show his favoritism. The brothers didn't like this and made plans to kill Joseph. Reuben, the eldest brother, had a bit of the fear of God in him and convinced his brothers to sell Joseph into slavery rather than kill him, and then lie to their father Israel and tell him that Joseph was dead. The Ten Commandments come a few hundred years later, so apparently all this seemed fine to the brothers, the killing and the selling and the lying. Joseph winds up in Egypt, where he is enslaved, sexually assaulted, and imprisoned. But through a series of unusually fortunate events, Joseph ends up being the number two man to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Back home in Canaan, Israel has his 12th son, Benjamin, my personal favorite, and then comes a famine in the land. But there is food in Egypt, and the 10 brothers end up in front of their brother Joseph, whom they had sold into slavery many years before, asking him for food. Joseph plays some games with his brothers, but eventually reveals himself to his brothers, saying, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Today we begin Holy Week, our real-time journey with our Lord from his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, which we celebrate today, to his cross on Good Friday and beyond. Many of the events we've read today are evil, but God meant them for good. This is the Christian doctrine of providence, and it reminds us of those words of St. Paul in Romans 8:28. We know that in everything, God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. The doctrine of providence is usually something the reformers are credited with emphasizing and developing, although the reformers were really just picking and choosing from St. Augustine of Hippo. I was pleased to find that, fortunately, the reformers didn't corner the market on providence. I found at least three saints, all named John, and all more Eastern than Western, who've written on providence. First, from the early 18th century, St. John of Tobolsk, who was born in Ukraine and died in Russia. He writes, What is providence? It is one of the basic characteristics of God to see all that is going on, was going on, and will be going on in the future as though it is the present, and to have omnipotent concern for safeguarding all creation and wisely managing all its manifestations. He also puts it a little more simply, there's nothing random in the world. In the 8th century, St. John of Damascus writes this, God is both creator and provider, and his power of creating, sustaining, and providing is his goodwill. And in the 4th century, one of our favorite saints, John, here at St. Michael's, St. John Chrysostom, writes this, It is clear that not our diligence, but the providence of God, even where we seem to be active, affects all. Closer to home, and not named John, is 20th century Anglican Dean Norman Hook. The doctrine of providence stands primarily for the essential nearness of God. Today's readings are saturated with examples of God's providence in the form of prophecy and fulfillment. In fact, the events of Palm Sunday and Holy Week have been prophesied since the beginning of time. We could go all the way back to Genesis 3, but I'm going to stick with the lengthy text we've read today. Much of the providence is both prophesied and fulfilled in these readings, hence the long texts. For example, in the Liturgy of the Palms, the Gospel has Jesus telling two of his disciples where to find a colt. Two verses later, they've got the colt and take it to Jesus. We see the same kind of thing in the Passion Gospel. He sends two disciples to follow a man carrying a jar of water, and two verses later, they reserve the upper room to prepare the Passover. A few verses later, in that upper room, 
Jesus predicts that one of the twelve will betray him. They respond one at a time, asking, Is it I? Thirty verses later, Judas shows up in the Garden of Gethsemane with a crowd carrying swords and clubs and betrays our Lord with a kiss. In the upper room, Jesus also predicts you will all fall away and even backs up this prediction with a prophecy from the prophet Zechariah. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. In spite of vehement denials by all the twelve, 20 verses later, Mark writes, and they all forsook him and fled. The most famous upper room prophecy is probably Peter's denials, three of them. Jesus predicts them in Mark 14.30, and in Mark 14.71, Peter hears the cock crow a second time, remembers what Jesus had said to him, and breaks down and weeps. These denials take place the same night, not months later, not days later, but just a few hours later. And it's not just in our gospel that we see providence in the form of prophecy. We hear it in our Old Testament reading from Isaiah. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Isaiah wrote that about 700 years before Mark wrote this from today's gospel. And they struck his head with a reed and spat on him, and they knelt down in homage to him. And did you hear this from today's psalm? They put their heads together against me. They plot to take my life. Put that with the gospel today. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. On Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and many Fridays, we read Psalm 22. And we will hear these words. In Psalm 22, verse 18, they divide my garments among them, and for my raiment they cast lots. In verse 16, they have pierced my hands and feet. And of course, that cry we heard in our gospel reading, the very first verse of Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. There is nothing random in the world. He's plotted against He's betrayed, he's run away from, he's denied, he takes the place of a murderer, he's judged, and he's executed. But he's still in control. In the first two verses of today's gospel, the religious leaders are plotting to arrest and kill him, but they say, not during the feast, lest there be a tumult of the people. And when does all this happen? During the feast. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. It could happen at no other time. As we heard during the Liturgy of the Palms, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in and be glad in it. That day in Psalm 118 is the day. That's why St. Luke records this exchange between the Pharisees and Jesus. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Why do the Pharisees say this? Because the crowd was calling out a psalm that was reserved for the Messiah's entrance into the holy city. Stop them, they cry. But Jesus answers, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. That is, what you're seeing is what you're getting. The Messiah promised and prophesied since Genesis 3 is coming into the holy city. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And that's why in the liturgy of the altar, we say the same words from Psalm 118 that were reserved for the day. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We say it every time, right? On this great day of triumphal entry, our Lord Jesus is in control. When he's on trial for blasphemy, our Lord is in control. And even when he's on the cross, Jesus is in control. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And for those of us who think he's too far away right now, and some days it does seem like the world is flying apart, doesn't it? When it seems like God is outside taking a smoke break or down at the water cooler exchanging gossip, let's remember those words of St. John of Tobolsk. There is nothing random in the world. And let's also remember how our Lord answers the chief priests in today's gospel. They ask, are you the Christ, 
the Son of the Blessed. And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. May God bless us, that in us may be found love and humility, obedience and thanksgiving, discipline, gentleness, and peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.